The path to God has been described as being only as broad as a razor's edge, and sometimes it is also as sharp. If by free choice one walks that narrow path with single-heartedness and doesn't flinch or give up because of its incisiveness, he will reach God. It sounds difficult, but I maintain that the path is very simple if one makes up his mind to go all the way for the love of God. Whosoever loves God can never think of turning back. How to Quicken Your Spiritual Progress Extracts from Lectures by Paramahansa Yogananda in 1943 Though the right attitude makes the path simple, that does not mean one will not encounter any conflicts and troubles along the way. But they do not dismay the true devotee. Among the tests that might be faced, doubt is a devastating obstacle. So many people get caught in the indecisiveness of doubt, in speculation about God, in wondering if it is really possible to know Him, and if so, whether they themselves have the capability to find Him. Several incarnations are often wasted in such irresolute thinking. I see how many seekers come and go on the path giving in to the ways of delusion. I look at their karma from the past, and though I am saddened by their lack of determination, I understand. That is why I am never over-encouraged when devotees come, and never discouraged by those who leave. I know exactly where the karma of each person is leading, but that pattern need not remain an absolute. If one listens to a master, he can change that self-created blueprint. He can overcome his karma. If one is in doubt about proper diet, he doesn't give up eating. Yet when confronted with doubts in the search of God, some people give up their spiritual nourishment as though they could live without it. In doing so, they suffer. Therefore, when doubts come, they should be abolished by faith and will. Cling to one who has found God. That is the sure way to succeed on the spiritual path. The blind cannot lead the blind. There are many who are trying to lead others, but who have no right to lead. The blind cannot lead the blind. No one can take you to God unless he himself has found God. Societies develop around charismatic personalities, but they die out with those personalities. A true guru has no personal ambition for name or fame. His one desire is to serve others with the realization of God. I sought all over India to find a true master. I searched in books. I journeyed from temple to temple, from one holy place to another. But my doubts followed me everywhere. But when I found that one who realized my guru, Sri Yukteswarji, and saw that spirit divine in his eyes, all doubt went away. Through his blessing, my whole life changed. That is why I stress to you the importance of following a true guru 
and his teachings. I told Master I would never teach about God unless I had tasted him. By following Guru unconditionally, I found God. When you are steadfast in the principles of the Guru-disciple relationship, the spiritual path becomes very easy. You cannot then go astray. No matter how delusion tries to pull you away, the master who has experienced God knows your trouble and will help you to steady yourself on the path again. That is what the Guru does for you, if you are in tune with him. Even though you and the Guru may be thousands of miles apart, his help will reach out to you. I feel Master with me all the time. Even though he is no longer incarnate on this earth plane, to have the guidance and grace of Guru with you that is the easiest way to move along on the spiritual path. God is already yours. God is not to be acquired. He is to be realized, for He is already yours. This I say to Him all the time. Lord, why do you hide yourself? You have no right to do so, because everyone is yours and you belong to everyone, permanently and everlastingly. So why this seeming separation? Half-hazard seekers excuse their spiritual lethargy by rationalizing, my mind is too restless, or I am too sensual, and so on. Never concentrate on your faults. By doing so, you identify yourself with them. You are the one who puts the veil of delusion in front of your wisdom's eyes. Whatsoever you think, that is what you are. During the day, you are tied to the remembrance of your weakness. But every night, when you forget the world in sleep, you also forget your limitations. In deep sleep, you are pure spirit, one with your infinite self. Why can't you realize that in the daytime? Every night God shows you what you are. Why doubt it? You are not the bundle of bones and flesh at all. Consciously, or unconsciously, you are with God. Beyond the dream state, the true self is manifest. Beyond the flights of fancy, formless am I. Your consciousness is expanded in the omnipresent spirit. Hold on to the thought that every night you are with spirit. Only temporarily do you forget him in the daytime. Of all the things God has given to man, it could be said that his greatest gift is sleep. Because it is the forgetting of this mortal dream, a respite from mortal consciousness. The ordinary man has no other escape, but even the crudest man has spiritual refreshment in the unconscious samadhi of sleep. Yet in contrast to conscious samadhi, sleep is a sort of narcotic. I have played with sleep. I have approached the sleep state and then remained in between wakefulness and somnolence. And sometimes I do sleep deeply and can at the same time watch myself sleeping. By the control of these states of consciousness, different realizations of the workings of the soul and ego came to me. Tonight, when you drift into sleep, you shall forget 
all of your weaknesses gathered through countless incarnations. You will be locked in the embrace of the Spirit. Learn to do that consciously in the daytime. Hold on to the unruffled inner calmness of deep sleep. Then you can know God, for in calmness you are with the infinite. Kriya Yoga, meditation, helps you establish your consciousness in that state. Regain your divine nature. It isn't only meditation that I emphasize. Meditation plus keeping your mind with God during activity is what is necessary. Half the battle will be won by meditation. For the soul power that you bring out by meditation will influence your thoughts and behavior during activity. When you meditate deeply, that gives you substantiation to your spiritual thoughts. The longer and deeper you meditate on a regular basis, the more you will find there is no difference between work and meditation. That is to say, whether you are working or meditating, you remain immersed in the divine consciousness of the blissful spirit. You no longer identify yourself with the activities and aches and pains of a mortal body. You realize you are pure spirit. The body is a nest of delusion and makes us believe in the reality of this finite world. But when we are with God, that seeming reality is gone. It is that simple. In the Samadhi state of meditation, we consciously enjoy the blissful awareness of God as the sole reality. Why do you give up your divine nature? Why do you put on all kinds of moods and emotions which distort the expression of what you really are? Practice even-mindedness, calmness all the time. Become a king, an absolute monarch, of your own mental realm of calmness. In calmness, the mind is wholly free of emotional agitations. Unless the mind is calm, God will be obscured. So let nothing disturb your peaceable kingdom of calmness. Night and day, Carry with you the joy of the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Moods are your greatest enemy. Don't indulge in them. Destroy them, for they are a formidable stumbling block in the path of your progress. With relentless might of watchfulness, guard yourself against moods. No matter what trials come, I never permit moods to enter my consciousness. And I prefer not to mix with anyone who is moody. I won't give heed to their moods because they are very contagious. Somebody is grouchy. You go around him and you will feel grouchy too. Mix with those who have a positive, cheerful disposition. Somebody is smiling. You go around that person and you will feel like smiling. Never try to get even with anyone and don't find faults with others. Correct yourself. The whole world may mistreat you, but why should you mistreat yourself by wrong behavior? Do not accept limiting influences. Remember that all of your troubles are only grafts on your consciousness. They do not belong to your soul. So why accept their limiting influence? Why be fearful or doubtful? Why say 
that you are restless or moody, or that you can't meditate. Such statements are a lie, for they contradict the truth of your real self. Rather, inwardly affirm, I am a child of God. I am with him. He is with me. For these many years since childhood, even though sometimes my mind might have been restless, still I do not remember a week or a day or even a minute that I have not been inwardly with him night and day. That is the way to live your life. In the beginning, and perhaps for years, you have to make constant effort. And then the need for effort is past, for you were always with God. The would-be concert pianist must practice and practice until finally the music becomes a part of him. As the writer is always thinking of his compositions, and as the inventive engineer is always thinking of mechanics. So the divine man is all the time thinking of God. To have that constant remembrance of God is to be intensely happy. Nothing can describe that divine joy. Yesterday, I was busy all day with people. And it was late, before I can get to my time of silence. But when I sat in my room to meditate, my mind was instantly with God. I prayed, Lord, you are myself. And as soon as I said that, the world floated away from my consciousness, and I was in complete ecstasy with God. The time will come when you will have that experience if you make the effort. God has already given himself to you, but you have not accepted him, that you do not make the necessary effort to know him is the underlying cause of all your sorrow. You bring it on yourself. Lord, thou didst Make me a prince, but I willfully wandered away from my divine realm, and like a prodigal son, I choose to be a beggar. Of course, I also blame God and say that he is primarily responsible for our difficulties because he created us. Every day I scold him, I say, Lord, haven't you gathered much bad karma for creating this troublesome world? But I know he has no karma. And when you realize your oneness with him, that you are made in his image, you have no karma either. That is why I do not stress too much the theory of karma. The more you hold onto the concept of limitation, the more you bind yourself. Jesus said, Is it not written in your law? I said, Ye are gods? The advanced attitude is not to dwell on the idea of sin, for it is a lie. When a sleeping prince is dreaming, that he is a beggar and cries out in anguish at his poverty and hunger, you do not say to him, Beggar, wake up! You say, Prince, wake up! Similarly, why should anyone call himself or another a sinner? Forget that notion. No matter what mistakes you have made, hold constantly to the thought. Lord, I am made in thine image. You have within you the power to be good.
want not else but God. What is the use of just crying and bewailing your lot? Make up your mind that you can have God in this lifetime. To Him you must go, because in Him is your home. As long as you stay away from God, there will be no end to your troubles, physical, moral, or mental, or spiritual. You do not know what you may have to go through, but you have enough intelligence to know yourself and to realize that you must go back to God whence you came. Your love for God should be so great that you want naught else but Him. I cannot think of any desire to ask of Him. Sometimes I do ask for something in connection with His work, and He grants it, often immediately. But I can never ask for anything for myself except be thou with me always. It doesn't matter what trials come to me, just give me the strength to meet them with thy consciousness. But never test me, Lord, with your absence. Often I tell the Lord, I am on to your tricks now. You have created this world enticing to the senses to find out whether we love you or your creation. I want you, my Lord. There is no one who can help me fill my heart but you. Only you. Talk to God in that way. He will make you think He is not responding. But when you are least looking for it, if you have complete love and trust, He will answer you. Even when you think God is away from you, if you still are continuously longing for Him, why isn't He coming? He is with you. Remember that. He is watching you. He knows every thought you think, every feeling you feel. To keep the mind full of rubbish is foolish. Fill your mind with thoughts of God. Pray for the unceasing remembrance of God. Think of Him before you act, while you are acting, and after you have finished your duties. He who perceives me everywhere and beholds everything in me, never loses sight of me, nor do I ever lose sight of him. He is nearest of the near, dearest of the dear, closer than the closest. Hold on to the truth that God is the most important thing in your life. 
So long as you cling to human love, or life, or beauty, or fame, or money, or anything else as important, he will not come to you. You were sent on earth to experience God's cosmic show and then return to your abode in him. But you have made this movie house your home. This is no longer a home for me. To the worldly person, that seems very strange to say. But it is the most wonderful consciousness. What else could you want when you have established yourself in never-ending happiness? When you are in that ever new joy, how can you be in a mood or angry or crave this or that? You have no time for such mortal entanglements. I find that I am inwardly aloof from everything now, locked in oneness with God. I am not interested in anything else except in those who are interested in God. The idea of joining a religious congregation in order to acquire health or wealth or power is nonsense. These are diverting ideas. Of course, health is better than sickness, and success is better than failure. But the purpose of religion is to take you to God. Somehow you must get back to Him. The only way we know how to please God is to cast away all desires, even the desire for health. Inwardly be a perfect renunciant. Look after the needs of the body and mind and fulfill your God-given duties, but with desireless non-attachment. Flying away from the world is not necessary. Neither should you become too engrossed in the world, because then you will not be able to remain inwardly non-attached. Those who, out of laziness, forsake all duties on the pretext of seeking God in seclusion multiply their troubles. Their moods, their passions, their weaknesses accompany them wherever they go. Dutiful action combined with meditation is the surer way to conquer the little self. Why should God amuse us with powers and miracles. Another flaw common to unsettled spiritual seekers is that they begin to feel spiritually stale when the Lord doesn't give them phenomenal demonstrations. Why should God amuse us with powers and miracles? If you are inclined towards these, you do not want God, and you will not find Him. When you truly desire God, you do not crave anything else, and that includes powers.
The attainment of the ability to perform miracles, feats, is not necessarily an indication that one knows God. The divine man doesn't care for such capabilities. He worships the soul power. God. When you know God, you may not yourself possess miraculous powers, but at your command lies all the power of the universe if you need it. God gave me so many powers in this life, but I gave them back to him. I use them only if he tells me to do so. There is a story of the mystic Madhusudan and his meeting with Goraknath, the saint of Gorakhpur, where my body was born. When I heard this story, that cured me of any wish for miraculous powers. Goraknath had attained all eight powers of a fully enlightened yogi. At the time of his departure from the body, he wanted to bestow his powers on some worthy soul. The masters can do that. Even as the mantle of Elijah's power was passed to Elisha. One day, Goraknath saw in a vision a young man, a very spiritual soul, standing by the Ganges in Banaras. Having the power to transport himself astrally from one place to another, Goraknath appeared before the young man, Madhusudan. Who looked up and seeing the saint said, Please do not stand in front of me. You are obstructing the sun. The saint replied, Do you not know who I am? I am Goroknath. I know, but I am busy now with my devotions. After some time, the devotee inquired of the saint, What is it you want from me? Goraknath explained, I have eight powers, and the one to whom I give this Chintamani, a mystical gem that grants all wishes, will have these powers. I wish to offer them to you. Madhusudan said, All right, give them to me. Whereupon, to the great astonishment of Goraknath, he took the mystical gem and threw it far out into the waters of the Ganges. Why did you do that? Goraknath demanded. Then the young man said, Delusion still, delusion still. Those powers were given to me to do with as I wished, were they not? Well, that is the only use I have for them. Compared to that which I already have, they are nothing. The great Goraknath bowed down to him and said, You have rid me of the last delusion that was keeping me from God. Even the great ones sometimes get distracted from the goal. Goraknath was so enamored with his powers that he had not gone beyond them to God. But when at last he renounced attachment to that treasured possession, he attained God union. You see, delusion takes many forms, but the divine devotee is like the single-hearted Madhusudan 
in the story. When you love God, you do not desire anything else because God is the most lovable of anything you could possess. The devotee will accept no substitute for God. He knows that God is all in all, that He is ever-present, and that He alone is a sure refuge from the travails of life. Live in the unchanging reality. At one time, this world seemed so real to me, but I experience it now just like a motion picture. I see my mother sitting in Gorakhpur, peeling mangoes for me. It is as clear as if it were happening now, even though that mother whom I loved is no more. Those early scenes of my childhood are all coming to me. In the same way, this present motion picture segment with all of you sitting here with me will one day be gone, replaced by new scenes and actors in the progressive film of time. Yet it will always remain in the cosmic movie archives. Though I live in this world and behold it as a moving picture show that continuously comes and goes, still, most of the time, this earthly movie is away from my consciousness. I go within, into the unchanging reality. That is the way to seek God. Live in that eternal consciousness. By searching the whole world, you will not find God. Intellectual discourses about the Creator will not give you God. But by seeking Him within, making the effort every day, you will find Him. The way to God is not through the intellect, but through intuition. Spirituality is measured by what you experience intuitively from the communion of your soul with God. It is so simple if inside you are always talking to him. Lord, come to me. Why do you put up a barrier of doubt between yourself and God? If you love him and inwardly talk to him and know he is with you, you will get much more results than from hours of just sitting absent-mindedly in silence supposedly meditating, with your mind wandering over everything but God. Keep him in your heart all the time. And when you meditate, go deep in divine communion. Ultimately, you are wholly dependent on God. You cannot utter one word without the power of God. 
He throbs in your heart. He thinks through your brain. He knows your every thought and action, even before you do. Why do you doubt him? Talk straight to him. Speak to him. He will not disappoint you. Conversation with God requires silence. Conversation with people requires audible voice. Conversation with God requires silence. People who talk too much are not with God. There is much less time in their thoughts for Him. Those who inwardly converse with God are outwardly more silent. No matter what their surroundings, they are habitually more quiet because the devotee has plenty to say to God. He has very little to say to others. When those who have much to say to God do speak, their words are of God and are full of wisdom and understanding. When the perception of God begins, you have no time for useless things. You want to remain by yourself, God and yourself, and you do not want to waste a precious moment that could rather be spent with Him. Even when such devotees are active, that activity never diminishes their perception of love for God. Idle talking causes one to lose devotion for God. It feeds mental restlessness that takes the mind away from Him. Yesterday, I was sitting by the pool here in Encinitas. There was a lot of chattering going on. But I was in that infinite light, wherein the sky and everything was absorbed in divine radiance. I was practicing silence all the while. It isn't a forced state, but an inner stillness and peace that becomes a part of one's nature. Try unceasingly to keep your mind on God. Be with Him all the time. Practice His presence. Don't waste your time. In this world of activity, the daytime is the devil's playground. The only way to outwit the devil is to keep your mind with God. And when night comes, forsake the world and all your cares of the day and meditate. Be entranced with the love of God. To be with Him is a million times more joyous and strengthening than is sleep. We are souls, not fleshy beings. We are souls, individualized spirit. That is why we must turn back toward God. We must think of ourselves as souls, not as fleshy beings. Now when I see the picture of my father and mother, I cannot believe my body was ever born from them because I know they also were made by God. The potter made the clay and fashioned out of it my father and mother and me. How shall I then say that my parents created me? My father in heaven was solely responsible for my coming. 
Similarly, Shankara said, No birth, no death, no caste have I. Father, mother, have I none. I am he. I am he. Blessed Spirit, I am he. Now those earthly parents are gone, but in my consciousness and in my memory of my soul, they remain as a part of God, as I am a part of God. So how can I limit that memory by calling them my father and mother? Devotion to parents is next to devotion to God because your true parent appointed them to look after you. But your first loyalty should be to God, the parent behind father and mother. God is your father. God is your mother. God is your supreme love. With God, parental and other human relationships are wonderful. But without God, they are only an interplay of the laws of karma and nature for this one lifetime. Those relationships would mean nothing if God had not put his thought and love in our hearts. If you knew how beautiful your soul is, and how you have marred its expression in the ego and jarred that divine consciousness through wrong action, you would be astonished. Most people think of this life as so attractive, yet in time they tire of it, and in death go back unconsciously toward the soul. My consciousness is exactly reversed. I live in the soul now, and yet somehow carry on my work in this world. But I do not allow myself to be attached to anything, for I see the inequities and temporality of life. I see the cruelties, the big fish eating the little fish, one animal living on the flesh of another, life fighting life, the horrors of poverty and disease. I say, Lord, this is your show, so be it, but I do not care to be a part of it except to do your will. As quickly as I can, I shall do your work and get out of this play of yours. But I want to take others also away from this delusive drama of comedies and nightmares. Do not take this life too seriously. It will be gone before you know it. When our childhood was there, life seemed so beautiful. There were so many things to want, so many things to enjoy with so little responsibility. But now see how life is. All those dreams are gone. In the same way, this episode in life will pass away. But as long as it exists for you, have but one trend of thought in your mind, God. If you seek him earnestly, how can he resist your love? Constantly, inwardly talk to him then he cannot remain away from you. 
Give my mother a soul call. She can't remain hidden anymore. Close your eyes, think of God, and give the Divine Mother a call from your soul. This you can do anytime, anywhere. No matter what else you may be doing, you can mentally converse with God. My Lord, I am looking for you. I don't want anything but you alone. I long to be with you always. You made me in your image and my home is with you. You have no right to keep me away from you. Maybe I have done wrong, tempted by delusions of your cosmic play. But because you are my mother, my father, my friend, I know you will forgive me and take me back. I want to go home. I want to come to thee. Excerpts from the book Journey to Self-Realization by Paramahansa Yogananda.